the last couple of weeks because of those plays and all that stuff. And so we're going to have to get down in and dig in a little bit tonight. And uh, we need it. As we think about 1997, we are standing on the threshold. We are in the open door. We're treading on a borderline that we've never trod before. Another year is opening and another year is gone. We've passed the darkness of the night and we're in the early morn. We've left the fields behind us for which we scattered seed and we pass into the future that none of us can read. Then we must hasten to fresh labor to thresh and reap and sow and bid the new year welcome and let the old year go. There's not a thing in the world you can do about what you did or didn't do in 1996. Gone. You can stay up here and cry for three hours over something you did in February of this year and it ain't gonna change it one bit. You've got your sins under the blood of Jesus. That's all that matters. It matters not what people say or think. It's what God knows about you that's important. And if you're right with God here tonight, uh, that's all that matters. You're right with God. Everything else will work if you're right with God. As we look into this new year coming up here in a couple of days, I'd like to bring some thoughts to you, and I hope you'll stay with me and listen to these things real carefully. First thing I'd like for us to do as we approach the new year is we should take a new look at the old book. First Timothy chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, please. Let's turn over there just for a minute. We need to take a new look at the old book. You say, now, dear, the Bible's dry and boring and cold reading. Well, some of it is. And the reason the Lord lets some of it be dry and cold and boring, because life is dry and cold and boring lots of times. And the Bible's a book of life. It's a book of reality. And the Bible said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 13. This is Paul writing to Timothy, but it's also the Holy Spirit writing to us. And he said in 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to what? Reading. Do it again. You say it. Till I come, give attendance to what? Reading. It's God's will for you to read the Bible. To exhortation, to doctrine. He did not say, till I come, give attendance to listening. People say, well, I don't have time to read my Bible, but I made that New Testament on tape, preacher, and I listen to old Scarby in there, and I put him in my tape player, and that's just as good as reading it. No, that ain't what God said. That ain't what God said. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading. He did not say watching. You say, well, I'll tell you what I do for my spiritual food. Every morning when I get up, I turn the TBN on or the Trinity Broadcasting or, the, or um, uh, the family something or another and they got all these good Christian shows on there and while I'm ironing, I'll watch at least an hour of that before my soap operas come on. Well, I'll tell you what you are, ma'am. You are a miserable flop for the Lord. That's what you are. The Bible wants, the Lord wants you to read your Bible, man. He wants you to read your Bible. He wants you to read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. I had this message on, on, on a part of this message that I preached about two years ago. Now, I had it on the radio today over down in South Carolina and down in Granite Falls, and I began to study some of these notes again, and I thought I'd go over some of these things. We need to give attendance to reading the Bible. The Bible said in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. The Bible that's fallen apart usually belongs to a Christian who's not. Do you know that? I said the Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to the Christian who is not. You see these people that are falling apart sometimes cause their Bible still got them gold shiny pages and they've had it five years. No thumb marks, teardrops, nothing was wrong with their Bible just like it was the day they got it. And they think all you're supposed to do with it is put a four leaf clover in it or write down in it when somebody dies. The Bible that's falling apart belongs to the Christian who's not. Some uh, Patrick Henry said that the Bible is a book worth all other books. John Locke said, truth without any mixture 
of error. Amen? That's a good definition of the Word of God. You have laying in your lap tonight the King James 1611 Authorized Bible. It has 1,189 inspired chapters. It has 31,175 inspired verses. It has 810,697 inspired God-anointed Holy Ghost breathed words. It has 3,566,480 letters and God put one of them in there for you to read and me to read and he wants you to read the Bible. You ought to make up your mind if it highlights a devil, you're going to read your Bible through in 1997. We're going to take a new look at the old book. Do you know that? Yes, sir. Did you know you can read 10 chapters of the Bible a day? 10 a day, and you can read the Bible through three times in one year. That's an hour a day. Three times in a year. Did you know you can read five chapters in the Old Testament and five in the New and read through the Old Testament twice the New Testament almost seven times? That's five in the Old, five in the New. You can read five chapters a day and read the Old Testament through once and the New Testament through almost three times. Now, what is our problem? What is wrong with us that we will not read the greatest book ever given to mankind? What is wrong with us that we will not read the greatest gift that got the closest thing you can get to Jesus Christ on this earth is this book right here. It's not a pulpit. It's not a baptistry. It's not a cross on the wall. It's not a guy with a black robe, his collar turned around backwards. It's that book right there. That's the closest you'll ever come to the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, this book right here. I'm glad to say that God still uses this book. He still speaks through this book. It's this book that has the answer to your problems. It's this book that will lead you and guide you in your decisions that you've got to make. There is no other book like this book. I'll guarantee you that. Brother, this book is so far surpasses all the rest of the books. It's not even funny. There used to be a famous infidel in this country whose name, or the other country's name was Ingersoll. Ingersoll held up a copy of the Bible one time and he said this. He said, in 15 years, I'll have this book in the morgue. He said, in 15 years, the Bible will be buried. Nobody will read the Bible. It's over with. He said, it's going to be done with. People are going to quit fooling with it. In 15 years, he said, I'll have the Bible in the morgue. 15 years went by. Ingersoll was in the morgue and the Bible was still doing fine and people were still reading it and preaching it. An old famous philosopher named Hugh said this, quote, Methinks I see the twilight of Christianity. That's a dumb thing to say, wasn't it? He said, Methinks I see the twilight of Christianity. He said, Christianity's ending. It's over with. It's going to be gone soon. Did you know what? That old boy died in the auxiliary Bible church. Had the first meeting they ever had in the room in which that old philosopher died. You don't make foolish statements like that about God's Word. God's Word is a living power and it'll run over you. And I want to tell you something else, brother. If God said something, going to happen in this book, you might as well just bank on it and write it down because it am going to happen. Uh, it may not happen when you think, how you think, where you think, but it will come to pass if God said it happened in the Word of God. You ever heard of Voltaire? Voltaire said this. He said in 100 years, the Bible would be an outmoded and forgotten book only to be found in museums. When the hundred years was up, Voltaire's house was used and owned by Geneva Bible Society to print copies of the Word of God. And God said, see there, you never should have said nothing like that. You know what John Lennon said? John Lennon said, uh, Christianity will go. Christianity will, swink, will shrink. He said, we're more popular than the Beatles now. You know what happened to John Lennon? He's done gone on to hell and he's been there over 15 years now and Christianity's doing fine and the Bible's still doing fine and they still, even in this modern enlightened age that we're living in, there's still more people that believe the word of God than there ever has been on this planet and God's word's marching on and if you're not with it, you better get with the program, man. Uh, get with what's really happening. Get up to date. Get the B-I-B-L-E. Amen. We need to take a new look at the old book. I'll tell you what this Bible will do. You'll quit your sinning or quit your reading. Which one you quit? You'll quit your sinning or quit your reading. This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. When I get sin in my heart and I read my Bible, I'm miserable. And I'll either put my Bible down or I'll put my sin down. And you got to make up your mind. You're going to keep reading that book until sin moves out and the word of God fills your heart. 
Oh, I love the B-I-B-L-E, amen. It's a lamp under my feet. It's still a light under my path. It's protected us. We don't know how much that Bible's protected us. You hear about that fella come in one day and he come down there and these thugs got him one night on a street corner and he grabbed him and grabbed him around the corner and they started reaching in there searching him and everything. He said, we're gonna kill you, man. We're gonna kill you. Held him knife to his throat, you know, and everything. And he reached in there and pulled out, what's this, what's this? And it's a Bible. And one of them showed the other and said, oh no, he's one of them people. And they threw the Bible down and took off running around the corner, amen. That time that Bible had protected him. You hear about that fellow's in the army and his mama gave him a Bible take. She said, now son, you take this with you everywhere. And you keep it with him. He kept it in his shirt pocket right there. And the books were flying around him. People fly, dying all over him, around him like flies. And that old boy got hit. And buddy, he went down, went into shock and passed out there from fear. And he woke up and found out he wasn't dead. And uh, uh, he, he, and he woke, I reckon he found out he wasn't dead if he woke up. And he woke up and he found out he wasn't dead. He found out that that boy had hit that little testament there in his pocket. And boy, he hit that little testament and that thing had stopped at Psalm 91 and verse 7, which says this. I read Psalm 91 7, which said, A thousand shall put your right hand and ten thousand at your left hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I tell you, brother, this old book right here will protect you. This old book will help. You. There's no telling what kind of trouble it's kept me out of. Just this book right here. You know, I heard, I know this man. I know this man personally. His wife was messing around with this other man, running around on him when he's gone, and he come home and found out about it, and he's going to kill him. He said, I'm going to kill that man. He had murder in his heart. And he said, I started over there to kill him with murder in my heart. And he said, that scripture kept coming back. Vengeance mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And he said, that's the only thing that kept me from murdering him and going to prison. There ain't no other book like this book. Hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against God. What at all shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to the word hey, Listen, a seminar ain't what you need. Uh, I mean, a course on this ain't what you need. Or how to you, you raise your self-esteem. You need to just stick your nose in this book for three or four days and just wallow in the God and it'll help you get the victory over what you need victory over. Amen? Take a new look at the old book. You ladies want them old wicked perverts at work to leave you alone? Do you really? See, have you ever seen these ladies? They wear their pants like this right here. They're tight. I can't even get mine that tight. Like this. I mean, cutting off the circulation, man. I mean, it looked like, I mean, if they had a quarter in their back pocket, you'd tell if his heads or tails. And their eyes would look like this about them. And you'd write your initials on their face. And boy, I mean, I mean, they, they all look like going to work and say, oh, these men won't leave me alone. I'm sexually harassed. You really want them to quit? I believe mean, about how you just don't want them to quit. You like it and even bag it on and brush by them sometimes. You really want them to quit? Take this book with you right here. Put it right in here on the arm. Walk in and one of them says, hey, good looking, where you eat at? Let us praise the Lord. God, that was good to us yesterday. We had the best service ever was. They'll not say another word to you. If they're a good Christian, they'll want to talk to you, and that's all right. But if they're just some old, uh, uh, you know, somebody chased you, they'll leave you alone, I promise you. I promise you that, brother. This old book right here, take a new look at the old book. It'll protect you, ladies. It'll protect you, man. It'll protect you, teenagers. You know what? I heard about this man. He was over in, uh, he, this old uh, philosopher, you know, like, Somebody trying to be Crocodile Dundee or somebody. You know how these nuts are. Grew up in California and, and want to live in Africa. Um, and uh, brother, I'll tell you, they want, they want to go over there and see giraffes, you know, and everything. And he went over there and seen elephants and everything. And there was a headhunter. And a missionary had been there and won this headhunter to Jesus. And boy, the mission, uh, headhunter got saved. He's fixing the stew, you know, boiling a big old pot. And he had a Bible laying right there. And that, the American came over there and he said, oh, I can't believe it. Who these idiots have done got over here and messed you up. You poor man. He said, you know, he said, I believe that Bible, sir. Just kept stirring. He said, oh, don't you tell me what good has that ever done anybody? Tell me one good thing that Bible's ever done anybody. And that old fellow sitting there, he said, if it were not for this Bible, your head would be in that pot. <laughs> and he just kept staring. It done him some good, didn't it? It'll protect you. We need to take a new look at the old book. 
You need to read it. You need to read it. You need to read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. Let God bless you. Let God speak to you through his word. You know who needs to read the Bible? Everybody. Amen. You know who to read the Bible? All for God. The strong for direction. The holy for warning. The humble for exaltation. The trouble for peace. The weary for rest. The doubting for assurance. The sinner for salvation. The young to learn how to live. The old to learn how to die. The ignorant for wisdom. The learned for humi- humility. The rich for compassion. The poor for comfort. The dreamer for enchantment. The practical for counsel. The weak for strength. The Bible is the word of God. It contains the mind of God. It contains the state of man and the way of salvation. Its doctrines are holy. Its priests are binding. Its history is true. Its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. Let it be a light to guide you. Food to support you. And to be a comfort to make you holy. It is the traveler's map. The pilgrim's staff. The pilot's compass. The soldier in the Christian's chart. It tells of paradise restored. Heaven open and hell disclosed. Amen. Christ is its subject. Our need is its design. God's glory is its end. Let it fill your mind. Fill the heart. God the feet. Read it prayerfully and fervently and slowly. Grab it up once in a while and go and give it a big old kiss and say thank God for the word of God. Take a new look at the old book. I'm just about to fill it here right now. Amen. Thank God for the Bible. I'm glad we got a Bible. I tell you what, we could be in Africa tonight not knowing where we come from, where we're going, worshiping rocks and priests and flowers, and we sit here tonight with a copy of the Word of God. We ought to be shouting over this bill. Amen. Take a new look at the old book. Secondly tonight, take a new walk down the old road. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, just a second. Jeremiah chapter number 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Now let's look at a new walk down the old road. Not many people walk in that old road anymore. Most of them want to walk the new road. That leads the wrong way. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse 16. Bow it there in Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord. Mark it here in your Bible now. Get this good. You want to start the new year out, right, kids? Here's what you ought to do. Take a new walk down the old road. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the what? Old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Lord, have mercy, we ought to take a new walk down the old road. You know, we're having a twin anniversary coming up. You know what I believe about worshiping God? Same thing I believed 20 years ago, except worse. Hey man, if we could shout up there in the old building with 40 in Sunday school, we can shout down here in the new building with 2,000 in Sunday school. You believe in that, preacher? Yes, sir. Don't you think it's out of date? No, sir. You believe that's the old way? Yes, sir. You believe it's the right way? Absolutely. And right, we need to take a new walk down the old road. Sometimes people come in here, people start shouting and praising God, and I've seen people in here. You know what that shows? That shows you've been going to a weird church. If you go to a church where nobody ever praises God, you go to a weird church and don't blame us. You know what you need to do? Read your Bible and find out how they praise God in the Bible. You know how they praise God in the Bible? They raise their hands, they said amen, they put their faces down on the ground, and they said it loud, and you can hear it afar off. And if you go to a church where people never, nobody ever raises their hand, and nobody ever says amen, that you can hear it afar off, you go to a church that's messed up, man. Don't get mad at me. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. There ain't nothing new about us. We're just holding on. Ow. <laughs> Who throwed that at me? It's a videotape. Miracle on 35th Street. But I want to tell you what. Uh, did you know something? Well, we need to take a new walk down the old road. Hey, listen, you know what? You know what? People ought to see your car pulling out of your driveway every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday in 1997. Heard me, didn't you? Heard me? Did you hear me? People, your neighbors, your neighbors ought even not to call you on Sunday night and Wednesday night because they know you're not going to be home. They know you're going to be at church. Ain't that right? 
You're going to be here now, ain't you? Some of you people, your year's resolution ought to be get your sorry hide up here on Wednesday night and get in God's house. You say, well, preacher, I just come in from work and I'm tired. Let me tell you something, buddy. The best place to rest your bones is right here studying God's word and singing and preaching. Take a new walk down the old road of worshiping God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be in the house of God and he'll bless you for it. Amen. How many of you never missed a Sunday at church this year? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Amen, all right, that's a good crowd, that's a blessing. God's been good to you, you good health, you ought to praise him for it, that's wonderful. We ought to take a new walk down the old road. It's amazing, some people. What if I ask you how many people never missed a day's work this year? I can't believe these people won't miss a day's work for nothing. Sign for a car, won't stop Monday morning, they'll call somebody, come get them. There you go, brother, thank you. Clock in 15 minutes early so they won't get docked. And start at seven. I, something's been on my heart and some of you are gonna get mad at me, but it's, it's not my fault, it's yours. How can you get mad at me if something's your fault? You know what's been bothering me lately? How we got mamas in here with three and four kids to get up and come to Sunday school every Sunday morning and we got grown adults from 19, 20, on up to 30 years old that can't even get up and come to Sunday school. I mean, I see y'all coming in on Sunday morning. An adult, you don't have no kids. You don't have no husband wife. It ain't no wonder you don't. Who wants easy bum like you? Now, it ain't my fault. Don't you dare get mad at me. You, listen, now what I'm saying is right. If you can't even get up and come to church, we got people with five kids you can get up and make it here. And not even mad. Um, amen. Preach it, Brother David. Take a new walk down the old road. When you first got saved, you would have not laid out of church like some of you do now. Amen. Preach it. It's amazing. It's amazing how the kids can't miss a ball game. Ain't it? But if they got ball practice, cheerleading, ball game, you're going to make sure they're there. Oh, they can miss that youth choir singing. They can miss that. that uh, this, they can miss that. No big deal, right? Yes, sir, it is a big deal. Take a new walk down the old road. Why do you even go to church? Some go to take a walk. Some go to laugh and talk. Some go to meet a friend. Some just their time to spend. Some go to meet a lover. Some go a fault to cover. Some go for speculation. Others just go for observation. Some go to snooze and nod. But others go to worship God. I, my goal in life is that nobody sleeps here on Sunday morning. My apples are gone, buddy. I'd throw something. That's an insult to God and His Word. One old guy said this, well, the way I look at it, preacher preaches me to sleep. He ought not to try to fuss at me. Some people, they slept while the Apostle Paul was preaching, one fella did. Yeah. Hear about that old man, he went, he slept through every service. Old Grandpa did, and the preacher finally told his little boy, he said, now, now Johnny, he said, if you'll keep Grandpa awake for me every Sunday morning, I'm going to pay you a dime. Every Sunday. So for a while, he'd done pretty good. Old Grandpa, he'd sit there, you know, and he'd start nothing off like that, and that, he'd kick him in the leg, you know, or pinch him, or reach up there and pull hair on his leg, you know, or he'd, he'd, he'd uh, kick him in the sh uh, and Grandpa would go up like that, you know. And it went pretty good three or four weeks there. Finally, it got to where Grandpa's sleeping again. Preacher called a little boy over, and he said, Now, Johnny, you're not doing your job. Grandpa will give you a dime no more. And he said, Grandpa will give me 15 cents to let him sleep. <laughs> I believe that must be what some of you do. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, brother. Why do you even go to church? You know, back in the old days, people, we know what we need to do. Just take a new walk down the old road. This modern generation's crazy. They really are. I, people say we're out of touch. Thank God. I'm glad we're not in touch with this generation. Lord have mercy. In the Bible, young women are taught to love their husbands. How many older ladies do we have now teaching women to love their husbands? Girl comes in now and says, I just got married. All the older women say, you're stupid. I'd never do it again. <laughs> Boy, what an encouragement to that young lady. Amen? Hey, listen, they were taught to be keepers at home. Ain't that what the Bible said? Women were taught to keep the home. You say, well, I have to clean this house. Well, that's your job. Did you get mad at me? Well, I think it's just as much. Well, you're a nut. That's what you are. You're a nut. The only way he 
it's easy, it's easy to teach you to do half the housework is if you work a job. And if you work a job, you're doing half of his job, which is paying bills, so he ought to do half of yours, which is cleaning the house. Amen, girls? It ain't right for a woman to a job and then have come on to all the housework and you lay around like a dog all evening with your feet propped up on the couch. Say hallelujah. Amen. Women were taught, <laughs> women were taught, brother, to be keepers at home. That's right, brother. Men were taught to respect their women. Do you know girls nowadays, 18 years old, they couldn't cook toast and jelly. <laughs> how, many, how many girls in here tonight we got that's under 21 can make biscuits from scratch? Don't lie. Don't you lie in the church house. You can make biscuits from scratch and you're under 21. Raise your hand, girls. One, two, three, four, five. Well, that's pretty good. That's more than I thought, to tell you the truth. You say, well, I don't know how. My wife will teach you. She knows how. Miss Parker taught her. And they're good too, man. They're good. They're good. There's ladies in here be glad that the girls. Don't you come whining in there in my office and say, Brother Danny, we want to get married if you don't even know how to cook. What are you, what are you going to live off of? We're going to eat out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured, man. That's what I figured. That's what I figured. You girls, some of you girls didn't even know you made biscuits. You thought you picked them off a biscuit bush in the middle of the summertime and kept them in the freezer and then thawed them out and fixed a batch of them every now and then. You'd be surprised. One girl, you know, you know, they love fried chicken and they saw an old chicken, you know, when you first cut it up and it's bloody on. Shoo! I don't, well, what did you think chicken was, girls? They got guts, they got blood. We're raised a generation that's out of touch with reality. We need to take a new walk down the old road. Amen? I'm not saying I want to go back and ride a horse and buggy, but good night, man. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with being honest and paying our bills and, and doing right now. Take a new walk down the old road. Amen. Then number three, quickly tonight. We need, we need a new willingness with the old wallet. Amen. <laughs> Boy, that cut it off right there, didn't it? We need a willingness with the old wallet. I told you what Corey did when she was real little. She had, uh, I think it was $30, $20 bill and a $10 bill. She's just real little. We set her on, on the bar there in her house, in the kitchen, and she'd sit there and there was dollars there, $20 bill, $10 bill. And I walked through the house something, and I happened to come back through there and she had tore that $20 bill and $10 bill all to pieces, just in a little bitty piece. I'm like, ah, what'd you do that for? She just laughing, just look. It didn't mean nothing to her. It meant absolutely nothing. And I got, the Lord talked to me about that. And I felt like the Lord was saying, yeah, you know, you know when you're just a little kid and your heart's full of love, you know, you don't care nothing about money. And I thought, boy, you know, when you're really right with God and everything's right between you and the Lord, you got the same attitude. You know the first sign you're backsliding? Well, the first sign you're backsliding is when you get that check cashed and you start taking them tithes out and you think, God, that's a lot of money. I can't believe I've been giving that ever. I'll, I'll put it in later. I'm going to say, that's the first time, sign your heart's getting cold right there. Hey, how can you think your religion is going to get you up in the rapture and, and transport you into the clouds, man, when you don't even believe God can bless you off 90% of your income when you pay your tithes and honor Him? Lord, and mercy of God's feet, you're tired and a bark on a tree, man. Uh, you sing through your nose, keep them wearing your false teeth out. Uh, you, you'd steal uh, from a, a spider. I mean, you'd, take, you'd take anything away from anybody if you won't even give God what belongs to Him. You know what they told me? That when I first got to say, they said, you give God your tithe. I said, what's that? And it looked like tithe in the Bible, T-I-T-H-E. I said, that's your tithe. And they said, uh, they said, you need to give God your, your tithe. And I said, what's that? And they said, 10%. And I said, all right. And I started putting it in there. I've been over 20 years and God's been good to me. God's blessed me and he's took care of me. And you know what I found out? The more I give, the more God gives back to me. We take a new willingness with the old wallet. I was thinking about our big day coming up. Boy, I wrote down some stuff. I'm getting some eyes now. I worked on it this evening. 
And I thought everything's going to be done in 20s that day, you know, in 20s, on the big day on, on March the 2nd. And I thought, boy, if everybody, I want our offering to be $20,000 that day. That's my goal. Our offering to be $20,000. Attendance, 2000 in Sunday school. And everything in twos, twos, 200, two hundred. Two. Wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody in here just were to say, hey, God's been good to me. God's blessed us. I love our church. I'm going to give a dollar for every person in Sunday school. That. Wouldn't that be a great blessing if a lot of people would do that? Sure it would. And we need a new willingness with all life. Listen, you'll never, you'll never give nothing to God's work with a sincere heart that he'll let it go by. He'll bless you in some way some other way down the road somewhere. I've never seen it fail one time. New willingness with the old wallet. And then third, uh, thirdly tonight, quickly or fourthly, we need to get a new zeal for the place of prayer. How long has it been since you got in a hot prayer meeting and prayed fervently? Praise God for Sister Parker's class and the ladies that's been getting in out there. Amen. Thank God. Listen, little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. God's work runs off the way God's people praise. It don't run off organization. We can have the marshals here and Elvis is burning and whoever else you want. I mean, brother, we can get anybody you want to think about in this pulpit. We can have it all organized, have bulletins printed up, have everything just down to a T. But if God's power is not here, nothing will be accomplished at last. Nobody's going to get saved. We need a new zeal for the place of prayer. We went to that little church last night. Boy, I was trying to find a place to pray. And I slipped in a room and there were some of our young men, teenage boys, some of these boys up here, just like this, laying right on their face, praying just like this. Oh, God. Oh, God, please. Oh, God, please. Just right like I promise you, it makes a difference. I'll guarantee you. Somebody asked John Wesley one time, the great Methodist people say, and the great power of God was building the Methodist church back in those days. They said, what's the secret? He said, come down here. Took them down steps, took them in a little room, and there on their faces were a bunch of men on their faces before God. And he said, right there is the secret of Methodism. Those men who pray. Listen, we're coming up on two of the biggest days in the history of our church, March 2nd, April the 18th. It's gonna take more prayer than we've ever prayed. It's gonna take harder work than we've ever did. Are we ready? We need to take a new, have a new zeal for the place of prayer. And then number five, quickly tonight, we need to take a new sight at some old saints. You know what we do? We get taking each other for granted. You know, I get letters a lot of times from people that's moved away and they write me and say, oh, Brother Danny, I miss you so much. I miss the church so much. I miss, I miss that. I'd give anything to be at New Man. I'd, you know, what's wrong with us here? How come we can't feel that way? It's just like husband and wife. Just like you start taking it for granted, don't you? We start taking the church for granted. Nah, no big deal. Did you know there are people all over the United States that would love just to live in driving distance of our church? They really are. I don't know why, but they would, buddy. I mean, they'd love it. They'd love it. We just we need to take a new look at some old saints. It's too bad somebody has to die before we tell them we appreciate them. Then they can't. You know, that's, that's awful. You know what causes problems in churches? Here's what causes problems in churches. And the bigger the church, the more you've got to understand this. You've got to understand that there's more people in here besides you. Now, you might not have heard that, but that, that's a profound statement, man. You've got to realize that there's more people in here besides you. You know what causes problems in churches? People tell me this all the time. Brother Danny, I wish you'd just preach on this. We need more of this in our church. You're right, I guarantee you. Brother Danny, we need this done in our church. You're right, I guarantee you. Brother Danny, we need this. And everybody thinks their little niche is the most important thing and sometimes even the only thing. But it's not. There's a lot goes on here at this church. We're stretching our tentacles out. I don't know if that's a good way to put it. Arms out. A long ways, man. Doing a lot of things. That camp, that school, all that. And you know what? The school says we need another building. The count says, we need to fix the ones we got. The bus minister says, our buses are broke down. 
Well, I mean, everybody says, my ministry is the most important. Don't they all go together to make the ministry that God's given us? And what we've got to do is do a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And where we get in trouble is where somebody's their little groove is the most important groove. It's not. They're all pieces of the pie that fit together that make our ministry here at our church. And what you've got to do is, trust me, man, I've got people pulling at me every direction wanting a piece of pie. So it's like I got some of them little Reese cups in this cup right here. And everybody says, Brother Danny, I want a Reese cup. Here you go. Brother Danny, I need a Reese cup. Here you go. Brother Danny, can I have a Reese cup? Here you go. Brother Danny, you got a bunch of Reese cups in there. How come I can't? I said, you got to realize there's more people wanting one of these things than just you. Can you all understand what I'm saying? we got to spread it around. We've got to do, uh, try to do the whole thing. We're, we're involved in a lot of things. That's why we need men to work on the balcony. That's why we need people to work in the bus ministry. That's why we need people in every direction doing what God would have them to do. We need to take a new look at some old saints. How about, you know what? It looks bad to me. It aggravates me. See some of you ladies that can sing like a bird, man, and don't sing the choir. I, mean, I don't even know, I don't understand why you'd do that. I wish you'd tell me. I mean, are you backslid? If you ain't right with God, we don't want you up here. That goes for any choir. That goes for any youth choir. Anybody who's not right with God don't have no business up here doing nothing. Amen? But if you are right with God, you half carry a tune, get up here and get in it, ladies. I seen Miss, Miss Betty Rowe come out here this morning, first row of ladies. She stopped right here. And the ladies lined up down through there. There's all them empty seats. Some of you ladies could be getting up being a blessing to somebody and you just sit there like a knot on a log wondering why you ain't getting a blessing. Look at you. You look so pitiful. Brother Danny, why are you fussing? Because you won't sing the choir. That's why. Get up. Get up. Get up. You say, I just don't feel like it. What do you think I do when it's preaching time and I don't feel like it? Preach anyway. You ain't never going to get nowhere just doing what you feel like doing. Get up! You say, I'm hoarse. What do you think I do when I'm hoarse? You say, I can't care a tune. Nilly vanilly, brother! Lip singing. <laughs> I mean, just, just act like you're singing. At least we'll look better with a full choir. Visitors will never know the difference. Praise God the whole time. You can do that when you're hoarse, got a sore throat. You know what? We could gripe. Sometimes somebody has the nerve to come to me and say somebody's griping about something. And I say, well, why didn't they call me and gripe? Well, they're scared to. Well, you can call me and gripe. But just remember, I can gripe about just as much as you can me. Probably more. Probably more. And the truth is, we all would like to see us all do better. Amen? We need to take a new sight. Settle some grudges. If you got any grudges, there's probably people in here got problems with each other. Won't speak. I, I'm not, I don't have anybody special in mind when I say that necessarily. But there's probably some people in here that I don't even know about that won't speak to somebody else because you heard they said something about you. And you won't go back to the choir because she's in the choir. Well, get over it, man. Get over it. Get up there and do something for God. Forget so-and-so. Forget so-and-so. Forget him. Just forget him. Do what God won't do. People even get mad. We've had people quit church because something a big preacher said. <laughs> that is smart. You know what? That is brilliant. Take your family and go to a dead church. Because one preacher that was visiting said something they didn't like. Ain't that a trip? Think about that. Now think about that. Here I'm up a family in a church that don't even believe the Bible and don't even believe the rapture and nobody's saved them forever because one visiting preacher, Brother Danny had preached, said something I disagreed with. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm never going back to Walmart as long as I live because that manager in there said something I didn't like? There's people like that. There's people said, well, I don't like so-and-so. It works at Ingalls. I'll never go in there again. You are a nut. That's what you are. You're a nut. If I hated everybody in Ingalls and they hated me, if they had something in that store I want, I'm going to go in there and get it. 
You're crazy, man. You're out of your mind. If you say, I'll never go in that store. I'm sure I know they're the cheapest and I know they got better bargains than I know they're, but so-and-so works at that steakhouse and I'll never step foot in there. You are about half crazy. But if I want a steak, I don't care if Charles Manson cooked it. I don't. As long as it ain't nasty, brother, and I, if I, I, if he, I don't care, brother. Marilyn Manson, I don't care. Michael Jackson can work there for all I care. If I want to eat there, I'm not going to let them control my life. I'm not going to let them make me miserable. I'm not going to let them mess up my, my schedule. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do, what God wants me to do, and they, they, they can have their own problems. Amen. Well, I'm just not going to the church, the church as long as she's going. Well, you need to see a psychiatrist or something. You've lost your mind. That's what your problem is. Number five, six, whatever. Get a new sincere burden for some old sinner. We need a new burden for some old sinners, don't we? Well, I was thinking about today. I was thinking about, somebody wrote me a letter and it's talking about shedding tears for sinners and things like that. And I thought, boy, it's been a while. It's been a while since I saw us, since I saw me, since I saw you weeping over some sinners. Bible said when Zion prevails, she'll bring forth sons and daughters. Whew. I got to thinking about our big day coming on the second day of March. I got to thinking about our guest. I got to thinking about putting a banner up here. I got to thinking about putting banners in the school. Flyers all over town, running it in the newspaper, putting it on video, organizing some home prayer meetings. You know what I, we're all wanting relatives and friends and stuff to come and that's fine, but a lot of times they're saved. You know what I really want us to concentrate on? But busting up a bunch of men in, in groups and hitting just these houses out here in Clinchfield and Stumptown, West Marion, West Marion, and down here in Dysersville and Glenwood and North Cove and Nebo and Old Fort and all that, and just getting into some houses. They may not come, but oh, what a witness you can get. See, you got an excuse. We're having our 20th anniversary. We'd like for you to come. Well, I don't want the church. Well, how about this? Are you saved? Do you know the Lord? We can talk to them. We need to get an old, a new burden. For some old sinners. Lord have mercy. It's going to be over with folks. 97 is going to be a year like we've never seen. I keep thinking about that. thing land on Mars on July the 4th. Independence Day. 1997. It ain't no accident that's the most popular movie in America right now. About the UFOs going to show up on Independence Day. Well, what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. But none of that stuff ain't accident. And it ain't no accident. God's been dealing with me about this for a few months. It ain't no accident. Something's up. Something's up. Something's up. We don't know that this might be our last year. We need to get a burden for some old sinners. You know what TV will do? I'm not saying it's wrong to watch everything on TV in moderation. Some things are, might be half decent. Maybe, sometimes. Do you know what the worst thing about TV is? It will dry up your tears for God just like that. It puts you in a whole different attitude, a whole different, now admit it, ain't that right? Movies, all, it, just make, it just makes you to work, nah, it's no big deal. It does something to you. It draws us up. Don't look at reality. We don't think about eternity. We think of cars and clothes and fancy houses and romance and love and sex and m money and all these things that the world make gods out of. We need to get a new look at some old sinner. I'm thinking, what's going to be my goal? I looked up 20 in the Bible this, this evening. The, wor the word 20 is in the Bible over 270 times. I begin to look at some of them. Boy, I got some good ones too. You know what I found out in Psalm 68, 17? That God has 20,000 chariots. We might use that. 20,000 chariots be here that Sunday morning. I made up my mind that me personally, now I'm letting my family bring my family, so I'm not counting them as my visitors. Like, you know, uh, immediate family, cousins, relatives. I'm letting my kids and Linda Houts in our family, she'll bring all of our family and I won't even get to count none of them. So you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to get other people. And I, plus, I'm going to get a lot of te- people from other town. But I made up my, I made up my mind that my goal is going to be 20 visitors on that Sunday morning. Man, boy, I've been here 20 years. I ought to be able to get 20 people to come that day, shouldn't I? That's a small goal. And I'm challenging everybody in here that would set that as a goal for 20 people. I'm challenging you to set a goal for maybe if everybody would bring three people. See, if you got a man, wife, and a kid in the family and you all bought three people, that'd be nine people. Just like that. Make up your mind what you're going to try to do on that day. You need to get a new look, a new burden, a new zeal. I was thinking, 20 years. Boy, what we could do with that. What an opportunity. We only got a few weeks. See, we got a few weeks in January and then about four in February and then it's going to be here before we know it. 20 years. I thought, man, if they do me like they did that other preacher, I'll get run off that day. So this will be my last chance to get to do anything. That one preacher down here had his 20th anniversary and after that they gave him his walking papers. Don't need you no more, preacher. <laughs> See you around. Man can't do nothing in 20 years. He ought to quit. I thought about 20, thought about 200, thought about 2,000. All numbers with twos and zeros. I thought about some commitments. I want our teenage girls. Teenage girls are always someone wanting to do something. One blessing about you girls that not having a boyfriend right now is you'll do something for God. When you get a boyfriend, all you think you want to do is talk to him. And one reason you ought to thank God if you ain't got a boyfriend is you're more available to do stuff for the Lord. And some of you teenage girls, you know what you ought to do? I think, uh, I think Linda and Kathy and Miss Linda Stevens, some of you girls, getting up our phone calling committee. And we're going to divide up the phone book into A, B, C, D. We'll call everybody in the phone book. And we can do all of Marion. We can do Morgan and Burke County. Amen? You say, some people in Burke County ain't going to come. Yeah, but we get this to them, can't we? Call them up. Call them up. Hello. You know, talk to them about the Lord. You know what we're going to do? We're trying to get some cottage prayer meetings organized. Some people would be willing to just let a prayer group come to your house on Monday nights or Tuesday nights or some, or maybe even Saturday night, and just pray. Just pray. We could see a lot of people saved that day. A whole lot of people saved that day. We're filling up our little book. You know what we're going to do? I want everybody to write down people that you're going to try to bring in these things and then write it down on another piece of paper and we'll have Kathy to run them off on some, some stationery and make prayer list. And then when these ladies meet to pray, and we meet to pray on Saturday night, we're going to go over them names on them prayer meetings. There'll be hundreds of hundreds. If you've got somebody you want us to pray for, put it down on a prayer list, turn it into her, and we're going to make one big huge prayer list. And maybe hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a thousand people. And put daddy's name on there. Listen, we're running out of time. Amen. If we do anything, we better do it. Amen. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've just got some things hindering me right now. You think I ain't? Let me show you how I feel right now. Come here a minute, Dusty. You grab this arm right here. This is my jacket. Get behind me. David, come here and get the other one. The jacket. And you grab the other. All right. Now, Daniel, just the jacket, not my arm. There you go. The sleeve, I guess. All right. Daniel, you come and get my coat collar back behind me. I feel like this. Now, Christian, come here and hand over my eyes. This is the way I feel right now, trying to live my Christian life. God, I'm going, God, I'm going. God, help me. God, help me. Oh, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. That's the way I feel. I feel like the devil just pulling on me with everything he's got. You say, Danny, you ought to just wait until your troubles are over. It ain't going to happen. You might as well go ahead and do something in the middle of your trouble. You might as well go ahead and shout while the devil is trying to hinder you. You, you know, we ain't got forever, man. We gotta make up our mind. We're just gonna, you know what? Most people are saying, if I just have this over with, or if I just threw this problem, or if I have this settled, or if I have this situation worked out, I could really do something for God. It ain't gonna happen. If after that, it'll be something else. And after that, it'll be something else. Go ahead and do it now. Matter of fact, that's why God lets us have trouble, because we'll give Him the glory that way and won't try to steal it for ourselves. Some of you been through a divorce. Loss of job, loss of health. You ought to still be in something for God. 
Don't let the trials that come your way knock you out. You say, it ain't easy. You said it, man. It ain't easy. The Lord never said it would be. He never said it would be. He said, we got to take up our cross and follow him. All you got to do is make it, get your heart right. And there'll be grace for every trial. We need to take and get us a new burden for some old sin. I know I preached a long time tonight, but you just kind of do it, wasn't you? We fooled around them Christmas plays for three weeks and got backslid. So we had a little extra dose tonight. And I don't know about you, but I think we need a fresh burden. Take a new look at the old book. Get a new zeal for the place of prayer. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Now what the Lord speak to you about tonight? He's jealous of anything that takes up your time. Anything anybody other than him and his spirit. God wants your heart here tonight. We need a new look at the old book. Some of you men here now, you're gonna need the leadership role. I'd be ashamed if I was a man in this church and let these teenage girls get out and visit more than I did. I'd be ashamed if I was you. And I am ashamed, brother. They'll put us to shame sometime. Come on, men. Where is your backbone? Lord, have mercy. Where's your backbone? What are you made out of? Jesus Christ died for you. The least we can do is live for him. Altar's filling up right now. If you need to come, just slip out of your seat and come. Come on, come on, come on right now. This, this may be the most important message you've heard in a while. Let's do something about it. Let's do something about it. Come tell the Lord what you're going to do starting out the new year. Tell the Lord what you're going to do starting out the new year. Dear God, have mercy on us tonight. Bless in this invitation. Do what ought to be done. Bless our church. Help us to start out the new year right. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.